In this screencast, we will begin a multi-part series on blunt abdominal trauma. We'll start by looking at active extravasation versus pseudoaneurysm. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to differentiate a pseudoaneurysm from active extravasation and recommend the next step and manage it based on key imaging features. The main decision you're trying to make when evaluating somebody who has been part of blunt abdominal trauma is whether they can be non-operatively managed, whether they're going to require some sort of angiography to stop bleeding or other vascular complications, or whether they're going to require a surgery. Before you make these key management decisions, you have to understand what type of facility you're practicing in and whether or not they have the appropriate level of care to manage a critically ill trauma patient. You need an intensive care unit. You must have 24-hour access to a CT scan. You need 24-hour angiography, often provided by an interventional radiology service. And you'll need a 24-hour operating room. That is why there is a trauma system or trauma network in most states, and patients are very quickly transferred to higher levels of care when they are found to be unstable or the victims of blunt trauma. Basic criteria for determining whether a patient is hemodynamically stable or unstable would include their blood pressure, their heart rate, whether you can detect any capillary refill, and whether or not they have altered mental status. These are four quick and easy ways to assess for hemodynamic stability. And patients who are unstable should be resuscitated. If resuscitation does not result in stability, they will often need to be operatively managed. If resuscitation results in stability, you can also often proceed to diagnostic imaging. Now that the patient is stable after resuscitation, how do we scan the patient? Well, there's a few different protocols, and this is very dependent on the institution that you're practicing. Here at UK, we will use a multi-phase scan, and we'll often do what we refer to as a man scan, where the entire body is scanned in multiple phases. We often will start with a non-contrast scan of the head and C-spine. We will then do a CTA of the head and neck. That will be followed by a CTA of the chest, predominantly looking for acute aortic injury. We will then do a portal venous scan of the abdomen and pelvis. And oftentimes we will get a delayed scan of three to five minutes. Having both arterial phase, portal venous phase, and delayed phase is going to be very helpful in distinguishing active extravasation from pseudoaneurysm. Some institutions are now trying to move toward a single pass approach to reduce the radiation exposure to a patient that multiple CTs require. In this single pass approach, we will still get a non-contrast examination of the head and cervical spine, but then we will get a CTA of the head and neck, aorta, and abdomen and pelvis in a single pass. Again, this reduces the amount of radiation the patient is exposed to but it doesn't give you that temporal information that you get by having an arterial phase, a portal venous phase, and a delayed phase. Now let's look a little bit closer at some of the findings of vascular injury. Vascular injuries are often what are causing the patient's hemodynamic instability, and identifying a vascular injury and classifying the type of vascular injury is critical to determining the next step in management. The two main types of vascular injury that we will see are pseudoaneurysms and active extravasation. I've given you two examples here of pseudoaneurysm and active extravasation. In one example, we can see this area of arterial opacification within the liver in the setting of blunt abdominal trauma. We see that arterial opacification maintains its shape and remains the same density as the aorta. In this other example, we can again see dense contrast, similar in density to the aorta around the spleen in a patient who's had blunt abdominal trauma. And notice that as we move through the phases, that density remains quite dense and also expands and even maybe starts to pool. And that is a critical feature differentiating active extravasation from pseudoaneurysm. Let's look at this in a graphical representation. In the arterial phase, we have two patients who have a very similar injury. So this is a graphical representation of the liver, and we have a liver laceration here in the left hemi liver. We also have a laceration in the kidney and a laceration in the spleen. And identifying pseudoaneurysm versus active extravasation will be very similar regardless of which solid organ you are looking at. So in the arterial phase, 
the pseudo aneurysm versus active extravasation can be difficult to differentiate because they will both show dense contrast opacification similar to the aorta. As we move into the next phase of contrast, the portal venous phase, we now see that the density of the pseudo aneurysm is going to remain similar to that of the aorta. And that's because this is actually still within what we call the blood pool. Blood is flowing into the pseudoaneurysm and out of the pseudoaneurysm. It often is related to an arterial vessel, and therefore its density will often be similar to our best arterial vessel as an intra reference, which is the aorta. So the density will decrease substantially in a similar, to a similar degree that the aorta decreases. In the case of active extravasation, the density of the area of active extravasation may not decrease to the same degree as the aorta. You think about active extravasation, it is not still contained within a vascular space, and therefore the contrast begins to pool, and it does not wash out as it might in pseudoaneurysm. So the density of active extravasation in the portal venous phase may be slightly greater than that of the aorta. On the delayed phase, we can often really start to differentiate pseudoaneurysms from active extravasation. This delayed phase may be at two to three minutes. In some institutions, it may be as far out as five minutes. On this delayed phase, the pseudoaneurysm will continue to maintain the same size and shape. It will also continue to have similar density to the aorta. Again, this is a contained injury that is contiguous with the vascular space, and so the density of the aorta will often be similar to the density of this contained vascular injury. Active extravasation is not a contained injury. So as the patient continues to bleed, contrast will continue to accumulate in that space. Now, there may be some dilutional effect of bleeding that continues to occur after contrast is cleared out of the aorta, but it, the area of active extravasation will often remain more dense than the aorta. And you will also get expansion of the abnormality. As bleeding continues, there will be an enlarging abnormality or vascular injury. And that is a key differentiating factor of pseudoaneurysm versus active extravasation. And that can be seen, again, in the liver, the kidney, or the spleen. Another feature that you can see with active extravasation is what I would refer to as pooling. So as the bleeding continues and the contrast continues to accumulate in that injury, you can see contrast that starts to pool or starts to spread in dependent spaces adjacent to the organ of injury. Often you can see that in the perisplenic space, in the perinephric space, under the surface of the left hemi liver, or even in Morrison's pouch with injuries of the right hemi liver. You can also sometimes identify this pooling of contrast within the pericolic gutters or the peritoneal space more generally, indicating hemoperitoneum. In summary, a pseudoaneurysm follows the arterial blood pool. It is a contained vascular space that communicates with the arteries, and therefore its density often reflects the density of contrast within arterial vessels. It should not change shape substantially, again, because it is a contained injury. Active extravasation, on the other hand, will remain dense. So as the contrast begins to be cleared from the aorta, the aorta will become less dense than the area of active extravasation. There may be some dilutional effect from continued bleeding uh, from the arterial vessel that no longer contains contrast, and that dilution will result in expansion and or pooling of the contrast, but the contrast will still typically be more dense than the aorta. When assessing a patient who's experienced blunt trauma, first assess for hemodynamic stability. If they're unstable, attempt resuscitation. If you can stabilize them after resuscitation, non-operative management tends to have the best outcome. To optimize non-operative management, you will often need a CT, and a multi-phase CT is going to provide you the best characterization of vascular injury and the best detection of vascular injuries. If you detect a vascular injury, it's important to differentiate a pseudoaneurysm versus active extravasation, although both of those injuries will typically be treated with angiography and embolization. We're going to talk more about the different grades of blunt organ injury in future parts to this series, but remember that a higher grade does not necessarily mean a higher chance for operative management. It just tends to indicate a greater chance of delayed complications 
and worse overall outcomes and may necessitate follow-up imaging. Thank you for your time. I hope you will join us for additional parts in this series on blunt abdominal trauma.